All right, good afternoon, everybody. Here with a Josh and Paul, and back by da popular demand, David Lehman, since we're going to be talking a little bit about our continuing opening strategy, uh, which is based upon the metrics. Let me tell you about our daily summary here. What you got to see is uh, the positivity rate uh, less than 2%. About 2.3% is the uh, seven day average. Uh, probably the lowest it has been and hospitalizations have been in um, many months, say four months. So this is a trend we were watching carefully and we see it has continued. Fatalities sadly at 15, but still a trend that's trending down a bit. That's because we're wearing the masks, that's good defense, and that's because of uh, our vaccination plan, which is a really good offense. We have now administered over 1 million doses of the vaccine. Uh, about 74% of the people over 75 have um, received uh, their first dose of the vaccine. Beginning to learn a little bit that maybe you get up to 70, 75%, you begin to hit a ceiling. So we're gonna be working on that to convince everybody to get their vaccine. But right now, those 65 to 74 are at 59%. I think they were probably 52% uh, a few days ago. 55 to 64, the group we opened up on Monday, uh, they are now at 17% uh, already. And I appreciate your patience. We had um, hundreds of thousands of people knocking on the door, wanting to get through that gate on a Monday, uh, eager folks, 55 to 64. And the, it went off uh, relatively well. I know it takes some patience. Um, and we're gonna have more openings available, if not this week, for sure next week. So we'll catch up. And again, if any of you are healthy, able to telecommute, maybe infected previously, not quite as urgent, give those others a, a little more time. Uh, the educator clinics are going are underway right now. We have 100 um, facilities around the state getting our, um, our educators vaccinated. That's not just teachers, but the paras and the nurses and the uh, food service workers and the custodians and the drivers and everybody related to keeping our schools open. And um, let's go to the next chart. This is sort of interesting. Josh put it together. I think what it tells me is that vaccinations are working. You see that a dotted vertical line, it shows you in mid-December, we started the vaccine rollout. It was fairly limited during those early days. You can see that our um, seven day moving average of fatalities peaked uh, uh, around two weeks later, about January 6th, 7th. And I can see, you can see that yellow line going down um, pretty continuously over the next uh, you know, month or so. And that yellow line sadly reflects fatalities, reflects hospitalizations, it reflects uh, complications, but it's a line that's going down. And it, it reminds us that we're beginning to get a handle on what works. It's uh, you know almost a year ago that we had our, our first uh, major infection, our first infection here, and soon there were our first fatality in Connecticut. And I think uh, we've learned uh, a number of things. It's not so much a question of how you adjust the dial and go capacity up 10% or down 10% or whether you have a curfew for two weeks or four weeks and then you go back. I, I think we're finding uh, what works is wearing the mask, social distancing and vaccinations. Let me show you what that implies for our next chart. Taking that lead, um, this is our plan starting on March 19th, which is, uh, I think, two weeks from today. Uh, as you know, many states uh, in our region, many states around the country have sort of capacity limits. Sometimes they go from 25% to 35% to 55%. We've been at 50 to 75%. Um, we're eliminating the capacity limits starting on March 19th. That's in two weeks. We'll be uh, eliminating those limits. Uh, and by the way, fortunately, most of you already have the distancing. We're maintaining that six foot of distancing. It's really important. So if you're at the gym, you're at the restaurant, make sure you keep that distancing in place. Uh, we're gonna maintain obviously the cleaning protocols. They work and it's also important for you because it tells a consumer that's maybe not as sure they wanna go indoor for dining quite yet if they see you got the six feet of spacing, they see you've got um, 
the uh, disinfecting going on, they show that you're serious about maintaining the, the social responsibility. And most importantly, we're keeping the mask mandate. I think it's a very important. I know what's happening in Texas and Mississippi. I've heard um, the president. Um, it's probably the most important thing you can do. So while we're lifting um, the capacity limits, we are going to maintain the mask and the spacing requirements. What that means in terms of restaurants, non-theater, we're keeping that in place, eight people to a table so it doesn't become a big party, and, uh, and we're going to maintain the 11 p.m. curfew. Uh, I know some of our other states have lifted the curfew. As your mother used to tell you, nothing good happens after 11 o'clock at night. Um, I know it gets more fun sometimes, but we're going to push that off a little bit longer. Libraries, museums, aquariums, again, they can lift the capacity there. Gyms, I mentioned. Retail and offices, um, no capacity limits. But again, I would use your common sense. I mean, if people can telecommute, you don't need to have everybody in there. It is probably safer, a little bit safer for them, a little bit safer for everybody else. But you can go back um, appropriately. Personal services, going from 75 to 100%. I think it's going to take a while for people to get back um, that way. They have put in the plexiglass. They've taken the protocols very seriously, for which we're thankful. And finally, the houses of worship. Uh, you know, we had a cap on that previously. Then we uh, lifted that. We're maintaining the six foot of distancing and maintaining the masking. And by the way, um, I've been to a few houses of worship in my day where more people are sort of my age than your age, a little bit older a lot more likely to have gotten vaccinated. I think we can do this in the, um, in the houses of worship safely, provided you wear the mask and the distancing. Uh, we're maintaining the capacity limits in movie theaters, performing arts. Again, a younger demographic, movie theaters. Um, my wife goes for the movie, I go for the popcorn. Your mask is off, you're sort of um, packed in there a little bit more likely. So I think 50% allows the distancing or allows you to stay within your cohort just a little bit longer. Other reopenings on uh, March 19th, uh, quickly, private residences, um, 25 people indoors, 100 outdoors. Um, 100 outdoors, as you know, outdoors is much safer. Uh, we'll see when it warms up. Next week could be in the 60s, so don't laugh. Um, again, wearing the mask, social distancing, use your common sense. I, you just got to use your common sense. If you've all been vaccinated, obviously it's a different situation. If you're with a lot of strangers, um, wear the mask. Commercial venues, we've already previously announced this. So, you know, these are event um, and as such. Uh, we wanted to give you a chance to plan. I'll just reiterate, 100 indoors, 200 outdoors. That's when the uh, event planner or, um, or caterers and as such. So think about this. Your grandmother's now been vaccinated. You didn't get to see her for a long time. If you ever wanted to do a, a party with friends, uh, this is probably a time you can start planning on that. Sports, again, March 19th, all sports will be allowed to practice and compete subject to the DPH guidelines and tournaments will be allowed. And finally, travel advisory. Remember, we've gone around on that a little bit. It was based upon what states were red hot, what states were less. I think at this point, uh, given the nature of the number of people who are um, getting vaccinated, um, we'll have a lot more people vaccinated between now and March 19th, by the way. You may say, why March 19th? A more people vaccinated, B, um, warmer weather, and C, more and more of our peers are sort of headed in the same direction as well. Massachusetts is, um, you know, relaxed their restaurants uh, at 100% already. Travel advisory, again, um, hopefully you can test and you don't have to quarantine as long. If you haven't tested, you're coming back from one of those um, uh, red hot states, so we urge you to quarantine, but that's now gonna be guidance. A little bit later, um, just two weeks later, because these are bigger uh, venues, but we wanted to give you time to plan accordingly. Uh, these are outdoor amusement parks, big outdoor event venues, 50% um, capacity capped at 10,000, you know, sports stadiums, for example, give you time to plan. You probably don't want to be outside much before that anyway. Indoor stadiums starting April uh, 2nd, that's 10% capacity and keep your spacing there, wear the mask. Uh, planning ahead for summer camps, we anticipate summer camps and the summer festivals. Um, more on that to follow. These are bigger events. They take some planning. We want to give you a little extra notice on that. Okay. 
This is not Texas. This is not Mississippi. This is Connecticut. Uh, we are maintaining the masks. I think I told you at the start, I think over the course of the year, we know what works and masks work. And uh, we have much lower infection rates of uh, those maskless states, much lower. And we're going to keep going what works. And I think that's important for your business so that people slowly start coming back in. They'll feel more confident when they see people wearing the masks. I'm afraid the inverse of that is bars. You know, I've been a little tough on bars. Um, uh, you, you can, they're open if you're serving food, if you're serving a meal. I appreciate that. That keeps things a little more structured. But I just remember from a year ago that people were self-regulating and less people were going to the schools, less people were going to um, the stores, less people were going to re restaurants as the COVID infection rate went up and people got scared. But less people were not <laughs> Uh, uh, going to the bars. More people were going to the bars. So I, I just going to keep the bars closed if there's just a drinking establishment for a little bit longer, because that's not something that's going to phase up. That could potentially ramp up more quickly. We're keeping the curfews in place. Um, I think the curfews, I've talked to a lot of municipal leaders. They, uh, they say, go, I, I can't tell if it's 50 or 70 percent. I'm not quite sure whether um, they're eating or just drinking. But I know if there's a loud party going on there after 11 o'clock at night, that is something I can enforce. And that's going to, uh, something we're going to continue for a little bit longer because I think it makes a difference. I think I talked about the indoor theaters. I talked about the 25-person cap on the indoor social gatherings. And we talked about the uh, big events um, in April. This next is, let's say we're a little tougher on curfews. Let's say... Um, uh, we're a little uh, bit, you know, strict on masks, um, and we're opening up on capacity. One place where we have op we're proud to be open and stay open is our schools. And um, the person I formerly know is Miguel, and we know is Jill. Now it's our first lady and our secretary of education. Um, they decided to make a priority going to a Benjamin Franklin School in Meriden. I was privileged to be invited to that. It's a school that's been open full time since um, September. Uh, and uh, the First Lady and uh, Miguel wanted to be able to showcase where it got our schools open. 99% of our schools in Connecticut open for some in person learning, most of it full time. And uh, Miguel was very clear to say, I'm proud of the way we were able to do that in Connecticut, proud that we were able to do that safely. And between he and the First Lady, they've got another 60 days under the President's order to see if they get everybody there. And I was so proud to see we prioritized our teachers, we prioritized everybody that works in the schools. And we've got over 100 of those centers uh, going right now. And one of the reasons is, um, A, just thank you. You showed up, you got our schools open. And uh, more broadly, I've got to give more and more parents and kids the confidence that they can go back to school. Even though the schools are open, even though the restaurants are open, even though um, some of the sports venues are open, not everybody necessarily wants to go back. And it's good that they pause in the other places, but I want the kids to start coming back to school. Some of our places, it's 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent. When the teachers are enthusiastic about the schools, you're enthusiastic about the school, and more kids will be going back to school. Let's have a great end of the school year. There's a lot to digest there, so let me uh, open it up to your questions now. Again, uh, Paul and Josh and uh, David Lehman. News 12, Connecticut. Fox 61. Uh, hi, Governor. First question, uh, we just want to know, how does it feel to be able to make the announcements that you are making tonight? This is the one-year anniversary almost of the pandemic, and to be reopening up a lot of these businesses this month at 100 percent, it's a pretty big deal for everyone across the state. So once again, how does it feel to you to be able to make these announcements this month? I think Connecticut has earned it. You know, it's been tough, and uh, people have been frustrated. They've been a uh, shelter at home, and uh, uh, a lot of our businesses really suffered, and uh, people um, took a hit. And I felt that, I think, um, more than most. Uh, so I, I'll tell you, it feels pretty good. It feels good that we're able to do this. It feels good that we've been slowly reopening since May 20th, and we really haven't had to turn back. Um, I hope to God that we don't have to turn back this time, that the metrics stay in a positive direction. 
And then we've had people reach out to us who through the VAM system were able to schedule vaccine appointments, but upon arrival were not able to because they didn't qualify. And that type of scenario, what happens to that vaccine? Because that person was selected through the system to receive one, but doesn't. Well, I don't know why you weren't able to qualify because you postulated what your age is, and that's our, our main determinant right now. I can tell you that none of those vaccines are going to waste. We have a, a standby system, so um, uh, we're not leaving any of those on the shelf. But, Josh, do you want to add to that? Yeah, that's right. All of our vaccine partners have uh, standby lists of other eligible people that they can fill any slots that come available. And as they get towards the end of the day, they're very careful about not opening extra vials and kind of managing their inventory as they get to the end of the day. I'm re really proud of all of our providers around the state who've done such a great job making sure every dose we have uh, gets into somebody's arm. NBC Connecticut. Governor, um, I, have a, I have two questions for you. The first um, is for uh, the restaurants. Um, if you're eliminating capacity, is it still a benefit to restaurants if they have to maintain the distance they already have with their tables and chairs and things like that? Do you see that as a benefit for the restaurants? It, it probably depends on the restaurant, but we are maintaining the six foot of social distancing. Some have the plexiglass there as well. They've worked really hard to give consumers a sense of confidence that they can go back. But David, do you want to help out on that question? No, I think you said it perfectly. The, the six foot spacing is really important and that's what restaurants have been doing, but many have embraced plexiglass, which does give them a bit more flexibility beyond the six foot spacing. So for, for many restaurants, this will uh, increase the amount of capacity and customers they can serve each night. Okay, thank you. And then the second question is, um, we've talked before about the efforts to reach um, SVI communities and communities that um, have uh, issues getting access to vaccines. So is there an update on the numbers on um, progress that we've made there? We're seeing that Yale is now doing pop-up clinics. There's also, you know, other local health departments. Is there any update on the progress there? Josh, do you have any numbers on that? Because I can tell you we're doubling down on this. Uh, we, uh, we've we gone in terms of our urban school district, making sure that those are school districts that we prioritized, make sure people get vaccinated. Josh? Yeah, no, that's right. We've been meeting regularly with providers all around the state, talking about strategies to make sure that people in those um, high SBI zip codes have access to vaccine. Um, we've got a number of initiatives underway. We've got dedicated call-in lines, outbound calling, uh, many of our providers are now reserving uh, appointment slots to make sure that people in those zip codes have easier access to, to book an appointment. We've got community health workers now out literally knocking on doors, more and more mobile clinics being spun up every day. So we're, we're working really hard at this, and uh, we, we are hopeful we'll see uh, you know improvements in those vaccination rates in, in the coming weeks. News 12 Connecticut. Do you guys have an update on when bars could be opened up? I know you said you want to um, keep them closed as of now. Um, and you did mention about uh, warmer weather. Does, will that be included in anything after March 19th? Just off the top of my head, I would say I think warmer weather does make a big difference. And uh, when we open things up, when it comes to, um, for example, bars, I would think outdoors would be a lot preferable than indoors. And uh, you got to remember that in and around April 20th, to be exact, uh, at that point, the legislature will have, um, you know, determinative say in terms of what else they'd like to change in terms of our executive orders. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, just kind of following up on that bar question, you know, bars defined by the state remain closed. Do you know how many have kind of adjusted their business model to include food so that they can't remain open? Do you know that, David? Yeah, Matt, that's a great question. So we, we believe there's between three and 400 uh, bars that, that have not adjusted, that are not open and not serving because of the uh, inability to provide that dining experience that is currently required. We believe other restaurants and pubs and the like have adjusted to provide the dining experience. Got it. And a question for you, Governor. You know, this move, it seems like this is another case of our state rejecting a CDC recommendation. The director this week urged states not to loosen restrictions. 
But the CDC is coming at this from strictly a medical perspective. While you have to balance the science as well as the economy. So can you share more on how we came to today's decision? Uh, yeah, we wanted to emphasize uh, that which works and that which is enforceable. And we know what works is the mask. We know what works is um, social distancing. And we know that uh, the curfew is something that uh, we can enforce. And we thought those are the three prime ways we can maintain um, the discipline uh, a little bit longer. Um, I think uh, going from 75 to 100 percent or 50 to 100 percent was less determinative and gives a lot of our um, partners in the, in the retail restaurant space a little bit more breathing room. Thank you very much. News 8. How strict are you going to be on the enforcement? I know you have to balance economy like we were just talking about on that question, economy versus health. Will this help? consumer confidence if you are uh, strictly enforcing the curfews and the masks? Yeah, well, when it comes to curfews, uh, that is very enforceable. That's one of the reasons, you know, you know what's happened in some of the cities, and uh, that was something that uh, the mayors and the public health department said uh, they really appreciated. I'll be blunt about it, though. I mean, when it comes to, um, you know, wearing the mask, a lot of that is self-enforced. Uh, if you, um, uh, and you're but thankfully, a lot of people are less likely to go to your store, a lot less likely to go to your restaurant if people are flagrantly uh, abusing the mask requirements. So there's a lot of self-enforcement there. And if there's some people that are defiant, we get a call. Governor, if, uh, if I may just add to that, we, we still do get at the state level uh, weekly complaints in businesses, and we've seen a, a steady decline to some of the lowest levels since reopening in May. Uh, and I think that's a function of we're 12 months into the pandemic now, and we've been open, reopened for 10 months. Uh, businesses and consumers, they, they, they know how to keep folks safe at this point in time. They understand the protocols. Uh, it is the new normal, if you will. So I, I think there's, um, th th there's been a lot of experience that's been had by businesses, and I think that's kept consumers safe. And we need to do that here for a few more months. Thank you. WTIC 1080 News. I at last check, according to the Industry Association, eight or 900 restaurants had closed across the state. Some were planning to reopen this spring. So for David Lehman, what's your latest intel on how many restaurants have closed and how many might come back? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Dave. I, I think the, the data that I've seen, and we have a regular dialogue with the Connecticut Restaurant Association, but the, the data that they reference are restaurants that have stopped ordering food. Uh, so not necessarily ones that have shut their doors permanently, but they've shut them until they can reopen at, at, at an economically viable time. My hope, uh, our hope is, especially with this new round of PPP uh, that many restaurants have taken part in, that you will see a, a lot, if not uh, all of them, reopen uh, this spring. We're not going to know the, the full extent of the, the permanent closures until we're through COVID and we see who's reopened, and then we'll see who, who was not able to, unfortunately. So how many have stopped ordering food? Uh, it's been in the hundreds. I can get an updated number for you, but it's been in the hundreds uh, of the 8,000 restaurants. Uh, and I, last I checked, I think it was in the high 100s. So a significant percentage, close to 10%, if not more. Governor, on the 11 p.m. curfew, did you think about lifting that or good? I, I thought about it. Um, and again, um, you know, Massachusetts lifted, for example. Uh, it just seems to me that um, restaurants and other places can sort of change their basic purpose after 11 o'clock at night, and we thought it was uh, probably um, a thoughtful thing to do to keep that curfew going just a little bit longer. The Associated Press. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor, with so many young people not vaccinated yet, is there concern about, uh, you know, uptick or spread of the virus among younger populations? We haven't really seen that um, to much degree yet, Dave. Um, uh, but, you know, as you know, over the last uh, you know, eight months, as our schools have been open, we did have an uptick in our community spread. It still was uh, much lower in the classroom. Uh, we are maintaining the uh, mandate, wearing the mask in the classroom, and I think that will probably continue a little bit longer. And uh, did any medical people uh are you talked to about doing this express any reservations about it 
Yeah, I talk to uh, an awful lot of folks. I mean, obviously, there's one point of view that says, let's keep things uh, locked down a little bit longer. Um, you can err on the side of that. Um, but we've got, um, you know, others that have said, look, we're looking at the numbers. We're looking at the metrics. We know what works. We'll probably have Scott Gottlieb on next week to uh, describe from his point of view as the former FDA chairman and a Connecticut resident um, his take on this. Yeah, thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Um, do we have any information on when uh, the CMS uh, could be expected to provide some updated uh, visitation requirements for new nursing homes, including uh, post vaccination guidelines? You know that, Josh? Uh, there, there's a lot of guidance out already about visitation, and I think given the, the dramatic decline in, in cases uh, that we've seen in our nursing homes, the vast majority of them are able to partake in, in visitation at this point uh, safely and in compliance with the CMS guidelines. Um, but generally speaking, we are awaiting some guidance from the CDC with regards to um, you know, different steps that people who are fully vaccinated may be able to consider. Um, I think that was originally slated to come out today. I think I saw that it may get pushed out a little bit further, but I think all states are looking forward to some additional guidance around uh, what can safely be done once you're fully vaccinated. And uh, Josh, I'd like to follow up on a, on a question Hugh McQuaid asked you earlier in the week. Um, in terms of the testing, is, is testing now sufficiently available in those vulnerable and hard to reach communities that uh, were targeted earlier uh, in the sort of the first uh, wave of this outbreak and are members of those communities uh, testing in sufficient numbers so that you can track what's what's happening there and uh, identify potential uh, outbreaks in uh, particular neighborhoods or uh, towns or cities? Yeah, we, we think we do. I mean, we still have all of our testing infrastructure up. Um, we've been talking mostly about vaccines over the last couple of months, but very quietly we continue to do among the most testing per capita in the nation. And so there still is a significant amount of capacity and availability out there for, for people to get tested. Um, so yes, we, we still do feel good about that. And uh, Governor, um, do you anticipate uh, reissuing, reissuing some sort of uh, either public health or civil preparedness uh, emergency declarations uh, after April 20th? You know, if you're going to uh, maintain a, a mask mandate, for example, and social distancing and, and these requirements that restaurants be, uh, you know, uh, be set up in certain ways, uh, I would imagine that you need some sort of authority and absent uh, an executive or uh, an emergency declaration. I'm not quite sure you can do that. So yeah, Paul, that, that's a good question. Other thing I'd say on the testing is um, we do a lot of the wastewater testing. And uh, so we're not out of the woods. Uh, the, uh, the infection rate was going down and now it's sort of stabilized. So we still have to continue to be careful, although a lot less likely to have complications because it's a younger demographic. Look, April 20th is the date that we said we thought we'd have um, most of our people vaccinated, at least most of the most vulnerable uh, vaccinated. We thought that was a date that would be warmer weather. We thought that was a date the legislature would probably be back here in person. So my, um, my instinct is that uh, assuming those things are all true and our, our infection rate is, is, continues to be under control, whatever I wanted to continue, we wanted to continue together post April 20th, we do in collaboration with the legislature. But you could collaborate with them and issue uh, declarations independent of, of legislative action. So you, are you saying that you, you want to do this in, in concert with the legislation, excuse me, with the legislature through legislative action? Yeah, we have a new general counsel. That team will probably be looking through all the executive orders, working with the legislature, deciding which of those we may want to continue past April 20th, perhaps the mass mandate for students so, so everybody can be in school safely. And uh, hopefully that could be a package that the legislature um, continues and approves. But, Paul, do you want to add to that? Yeah. No, thanks, Governor. Uh, as the governor said, I, there are many different ways that uh, we can be able to uh, move forward after April 20th. As the governor said, when we worked with the legislature to identify uh, that date, uh, it was our belief that 
uh, a lot of elements that will have us under the emergency preparedness and civil preparedness uh, guidance uh, would be at a different level. Uh, but everything is all uh, dependent upon where we are from a health standpoint, from a metric standpoint, and also uh, where we are to be able to respond to this emergency that we have, as many of those executive orders allow us to be nimble and allow us to be able to uh, not only set up vaccination sites, uh, work with our federal partners, uh, but also make sure that we are responding to this crisis firsthand for the people of Connecticut. So we're going to be working with the legislature as we did with the previous emergency orders. Uh, we'll have more details on that. But as the governor st stated, um, our legal department is already starting to work to get an understanding of what are the type of orders that would need uh, to uh, maintain and go forward after, after April 20th and work with the legislature about how we make sure that they're still implemented. Thanks, Paul. And just one last question for Dave uh, Lehman. Uh, do you have a, any figures on the number of complaints that uh, have been filed against businesses and any uh, enforcement actions that might have been taken as a result? I don't have the actual enforcement actions here at my fingertips, but in terms of complaints, uh, it's ranged. It started out around 300 or so per week, and more recently it's been below 200. Uh, and then if you look back to last fall, November, December, when we, we saw that increase in, in cases and hospitalizations, there were weeks there where we were north of 500. So uh, some of the lowest numbers we've seen in terms of complaints, and we'll get back to you on actual infractions and, and other enforcement mechanisms. Okay, thank you very much. The day of New London. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Governor. I wanted to ask if uh, talks have continued with the Mash and Tuckets regarding the gaming agreement. Anything since uh, ongoing since Tuesday? Uh, are you th think we're still close? Are we on that one inch line, as uh, Mr. Mountain said uh, the other day? Yeah, Brian, I think we are on that one inch line. We've had good, strong, collaborative discussions, really going back months, uh, if not years. And I think we're pretty close. This is a, a transformative time in the uh, gaming industry. The world is uh, moving virtual. Uh, both tribes know how important it is, as does the lottery in the state of Connecticut know that we move into that 21st century. How we do that allocation, we're very close on. I hope we'll have something positive to announce uh, with both tribal nations uh, very soon. So you, any, any date, any, any timetable in mind, any... Um... Yeah, Any well, more indication of when? Uh, look, sooner the better, but uh, let's let, um, you know, David Lehman and Melissa McCall, you know, finalize what we're going to do. Okay. Thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Um, let me take another swing at that. Uh, gambling question. Will you guys be continuing to talk with the Mash Tuckets throughout the weekend here? Yes. Yeah, um, it seemed like they were sort of upset uh, that uh, you guys made the call to sort of announce that agreement with the Mohegans. Uh, any regrets about that decision? No. no. I mean, uh, people were saying, um, uh, what are the terms of uh, the agreement? And uh, we said, look, this is the terms of the agreement that um, Mohegan Sun and um, the state of Connecticut find uh, is beneficial to both the tribal nation and the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. And we're continuing to talk. All three parties are continuing to talk. Okay. Uh, Governor, is there any, I spoke to some uh, medical uh, folks today who said that they don't, they don't think it's a great idea to lift these limitations right now. Is there any, you know, there's still some variables out there, right? Like the, uh, the highly infectious variants and things like that. Is there any threshold that might cause you to re kind of reinstate these? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You. I mean, first of all, um, not everybody wanted us to start reopening last May 20th. And we, we started and uh, for the next uh, seven months, the infection rate went down. Then there was a nationwide blip for a few months thereafter. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we had to think about the variants. That's the last uh, wild card in the deck. Uh, that gave us pause, let's say, um, a few weeks ago or a month ago. We saw what could be a spike in Miami, what could be a spike in San Diego. But it's been well over a month later. We haven't really seen that spike. Uh, so we give, have a little more confidence that if it is um, 
more infectious. It's not a hockey stick infectious that could overwhelm any of our systems. So we feel pretty confident with the decision we made. Okay. Thank you. The CT examiner. Hey, Governor Lamont, I want to know if you guys have a sense of with six foot distance between tables remaining in place, how many restaurants will actually be able to use 100% of their capacity or even really meaningfully increase it beyond what they can currently use? I'm going to pass that buck right to David Lehman. But the good news is that for the last, uh, you know, 11 months, these restaurants have been open with six feet of spacing. David? Yeah, that's right. That's right, Governor. It, it, it all depends on how the restaurant is, is laid out uh, in terms of their, their physical footprint and the, their ability or willingness to use the plexiglass, the dividers that we also allow. So again, for certain restaurants, and I can't give a definitive number, um, they're effectively at, uh, they're, the relaxing of the capacity is restriction is where they've been, but for other restaurants, they will be able to increase their capacity. Uh, the other thing here I would just mention, as, as uh, you know, the Governor alluded to before, some of this is around consumer confidence, and, and as we see vaccinations go up and, and virus transmission and hospitalizations go down, the consumer is going to be more confident and more willing to go to that restaurant. So not necessarily for that one seating, but many of these restaurants are looking for uh, two or three turns of the table so you could see more, more density um, throughout the night as opposed to just that one seating, which is also going to benefit them. Thank you. And Governor, if you weren't vaccinated yet, would you feel safe eating indoors at a full capacity restaurant right now? Uh I'll, I'll be blunt. I mean, if I can, if I can sit outside, I'll sit outside. It's just as uh, makes me feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, have I gone inside a couple of times when I found there was really uh, real space in there? Um, you know, I have, especially since I've been vaccinated. Thank you. The Hartford Current. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit about the process that went into making this decision. Back uh, last spring, there was a transparent reopening committee. This time around, there wasn't. So, uh, Governor, I'd be interested to hear um, kind of all the people you've spoken to, all the perspectives you've gotten in the last uh, week, um, both, you know, from the outreach that David and others do to the business community and also in terms of talking to public health people. Yeah, I'll start then, Josh. I mean, I can tell you that, uh, first of all, uh Governor Bill Lee of Tennessee and myself, you know, lead the uh, gubernatorial COVID-related efforts. So I had a lot of context from other governors, not just in this region, but uh, across the country. We're on with Jeff Zients in the COVID committee, so I get a lot of input uh, from um, the White House task force as well. Obviously, Deirdre and Josh have been working very closely with the, um, you know, the hospitals and a lot of the healthcare experts, many of whom advised us before. Uh, was it unanimous? No. Uh, I'll be blunt about it. I mean, um, there's a great um, why not wait? Why not wait? You know, there are variants. We don't know exactly. We could wait. Um, but I think there was general consensus that we know what works. We know we have capacity or hospitals. We know we can um, turn and change if we have to. But we haven't had to as yet. I know that we're sort of going this alongside Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So these are all things that gave me confidence we were making the right decision. But Josh, anything to add? No, I think that, that sums it up perfectly. So we heard what um, President Biden thinks about um, what Texas and Mississippi are doing. Um, in general, uh, his administration seems to sort of be advising against aggressive reopening at this point. Do you know what they uh, think about the path that you've taken here? Uh, what I heard the president say is, uh, wear the mask, don't be a dummy. I think he was quite clear about that. And I think he was uh, referring to Mississippi and Texas, which said, uh, let it rip, uh, no rules apply, uh, party, let's party. And um, Texas has done that before. You know, they um, opened the bars, things spiked up, closed the bars. Um, I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to give folks a little bit of notice. I'm trying to do this on a steady basis. And I'm trying to do it in a way that I think we can continue to make progress in holding down um, the COVID infection rate. And I think it's going to work. And then uh, last thing for me, um, I've already heard from some uh, restaurant people who say, well, um, teachers were moved up on the vaccination priority list specifically to help open schools to make sure that schools would be able to run at full capacity. Well, now you're asking restaurants and other businesses to open at full capacity. 
So why should workers in restaurants and in other um, industries feel comfortable going to work at full capacity when they have not been able to get vaccinated yet? Well, you can sort of make that same case for everybody under the age of 55. I think, you know, broadly are thinking that that's where the complications, that's how the risk, that's where the vulnerability, that's where the fatalities are. And I had a lot of food service workers uh, six months ago that were anxious about going to work. Not that they were anxious about themselves, but they're anxious because they were going home and they had a, um, a parent or a grandparent in, in living with them. And that's what made them uh, worried. So one of the things we have been able to do is make sure the folks most vulnerable in those households are vaccinated and you can come home safely. So I guess the question is what makes all of these other industries different from education? I just think it's absolutely vital for our kids, their well-being and their future, that we get our, our schools open, we keep them open. As you remember, um, you know, early on when we were doing an awful lot of testing, we didn't have any vaccinations there. Um, you know, sometimes somebody would uh, test positive or look like they tested positive. We had to shut down a wing or shut down the middle school. Kids went home and they had to wait 10 days or two weeks. We're trying to get some consistency to our education experience, make the last two months of this school year, three months, as positive as we can. All right. Thank you. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Yes, thanks, Governor. I want to follow up on Alex's question. Um, can you tell us who weighed in on those reopenings when you had those discussions? And, and um, was there overwhelming opposition from the medical advisors and, and what no, objections? No, 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 no. I wouldn't say that at all. I, you know, some people have, you know, why not wait another three months? Uh, uh, let's wait until we have herd immunity. Let's wait until 90% um, have the vaccination. I mean, you can, those are all reasonable points of view. But broadly speaking, I would say people understood what we were doing, why we we're doing it, and we're thankful that in terms of mass, in terms of curfew, in terms of social distancing, we're, we're reminding people we're not out of the woods yet. We can only do this safely. Uh, we can only reopen because the people of Connecticut have been sparked for the last six months and allowed us to get some control over the spread of this virus. Thanks. And then we're also hearing some complaints from state reps about uh, mixed signals on the eligibility of firefighters and police to receive the vaccine. Uh, what are the actual rules there and and um, why have state and uh, sorry, uh, police and firefighters been getting mixed signals? You got that one, Josh? I'm not sure. I haven't heard that. If they have questions, they can certainly reach out to DPH. But we've been clear that, um, you know, first responders who are potentially responding to calls where they could be in contact with uh, someone who could potentially have COVID-19 were eligible in phase 1A. And I, I believe the vast majority of them have uh, already been vaccinated. Thanks. And then uh, one more that's on, a, on the uh, gaming. Uh, why was Sport Tech uh, excluded from the negotiations with uh, the Mohegan and Meshantucket Pequot nations? What that, Paul? Yeah, I'll take and then let David go. Obviously, we, we have a compact. Uh, with uh, the tribal nations and that compact, it dictates uh, any expansion of gaming in the state of Connecticut. Um, so any conversations have to first and foremost start with them. Uh, as you saw from uh, the agreement that we put out with the uh, Mohegan tribal nation, and it's our hope that uh, Mashantucket Pequot tribal nation will also be joining on, uh, there is a role in which uh, sports tech can be able to play uh, with the Connecticut Lottery Corporation. So it's not a matter of keeping them out of negotiations, because uh, here's the thing: a lot of people would like to be a lot of people would like to be a part of those discussions. But you have to start the discussions with the very parties that will even allow us to have discussions, and that was the tribal nations. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. I'm piggybacking off of several of the restaurant questions. Um, some restaurant owners we spoke with today said the capacity limitations really doesn't change anything because of that six feet apart rule. I mean, there, is there any conversations about maybe changing the six feet apart going forward so they can capitalize on business? Why don't you take that, David? 
Yeah, uh, not right now is the is the short answer. Um, you know, as the governor mentioned, a April 20th is coming up and we'll, we'll monitor where we are as it relates to the virus and vaccine and see if uh, that, that six feet can be changed and limited. But I, I would I would underscore the point I said before in terms of consumer confidence. Um, again, that second and third turn of the table, I, I think you will see more folks looking to eat out. Uh, it, but the, the density of the restaurant absent the plexiglass, which is still a tool that is available, is not going to change over the next uh, two to four weeks. But we'll pick this up again in, in April. Let me just add on that that um, as early as next week, we could have temperatures in the 60s. And I think one of the silver linings of this COVID crowd, uh, cloud is we've seen what outdoor dining means. It means what it means to some of our, um, you know, main streets, which can be a little sleepy on occasion. And they have been coming to life. Sometimes they're using tents, sometimes they're using heaters, and pretty soon they won't need any of that. And I'd like to think that our um, municipalities and towns would be very creative about allowing our restaurants to continue that. And that will provide a lot of extra capacity for restaurants very safely. The Connecticut Mirror. Governor, in October, when you first rolled back uh, restrictions, you used similar language. You said Connecticut earned it. And then shortly thereafter, the metrics dictated to you to tighten things up again. Um, so based on that experience, are there specific metrics, positivity level, hospitalizations, so forth, that could let Connecticut know these will be the triggers about tightening things again, if necessary. Yeah, Paz, I mean, you're right. Um, we tried to start opening things uh, last fall, and then pretty soon you saw a 50-state uh, wave of COVID infections, uh, starting down in the south, then the Midwest, then coming right here to the northeast, and uh, we could not uh, keep that away. And uh, we did. We, uh, we stayed relatively strict, and some of our schools went to virtual for a while, at least hybrid. Um, I, don't, I can't give you an exact number that uh, would ever force us to change on that. But I, as I said then, I'd say now, um, I still look particularly at our hospitals. And if I saw that things were changing and that the hospitalizations and ICU capacities becoming at risk, that would be as somebody would say, we have to rethink that. That's not going to happen. You mentioned variants as a wild card. What is the latest data on what Connecticut is seeing as the type of variant and uh, the number of cases? Well, I can st I'll can. start with that. I mean, we've had now, what, something like uh, six weeks of experience where the variants were first seen in some of those states. We have not seen that ramp up a lot. You know, I, was, I was talking to Andy Slavitt. You remember him down in the COVID task force. And he said, we see a little bit south of New York, New Jersey, uh, but it's not spreading as quickly as we worried about. And fortunately, the um, vaccine works against it. But, you know, we are doing more and more testing right here in the state of Connecticut, so we have a better handle on it. Yeah, and, and to that end, um, you know, our state public health lab is now doing genomic sequencing as well. Um, they actually have, uh, we're going to uh, uh, release later today, they've identified three cases of the B117 variant, which is really the only one we've identified in any meaningful quantity in the state so far. But as the governor said, it, it does not seem like it's, uh, you know, really taken off. Okay. And the, the last thing, um, now that the JNJ &J vaccine is out, which does not require special refrigeration, uh, is there any thought to including primary care physicians as vaccinators after the 55 group is done? That, um, you know, we're getting some feedback from the medical society that it would be nice if there was that safety valve for primary care physicians to be able to uh, vaccinate the sickest patients based on their judgment, you know, perhaps at some point, perhaps not in this phase, but, you know, rather than going to 45 and above that you take this kind of broader approach. Any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I think we will eventually get to, um, particularly as supply and demand starts to level off. Um, they are still multi-use files, so they don't lend themselves well to, you know, uh, vaccinating a single patient, you know, on an office visit. 
Um, and, and you still do have the challenge that we had wrestled with and we've talked a lot about of, of, you know, when you start giving out that discretion, you know, where do you draw the lines, who's eligible, who's not. Um, and we also worry too about when you, when you spread out the, 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 these vaccines are so scarce and they're so precious right now. When you start spreading them out across an even broader set of providers down into individual doctor's offices, you end up with these little pockets of unused inventory all over the place. And we really want to have that right balance where we've got a lot of vaccinators who can get out into all the corners, particularly our underserved communities, have the mass vaccination sites that can really get to the masses, but not spread it so thin that you end up with a lot of doses going unused in, in you know, individual doctor's offices. But I do think we'll get there eventually, um, you know, probably as we start to see supply and demand level off more in the next couple of months. And I'm sorry, I just thought of another follow. Uh, Governor, you mentioned you're going to have Scott Gottlieb. Did you consult with him? Because he was on CNBC the other day talking about the importance of the of being flexible enough that the public will accept what restrictions that are there as opposed to being tighter and more conservative as he fears the CDC is about to uh, recommend. Yeah, we did have that conversation, uh, Paz, and it does make sense. You got to have people believe in the restrictions because they are self-enforcing primarily. And you want to make sure that whatever rules we had uh, would be enforced. Thank you all. You know, with that, let me just say um, our schools have been open and our kids are getting back to school, but not everybody comes back to school at the same time. we got to continue to build up that confidence so the kids can get back to school. Just because our restaurants and stores um, are going to be open at, quote, 100 percent capacity starting on March 19th, people will still take a little while to phase in there. I'm sure they're going to be looking at your front door, making sure that you're paying attention in terms of the distancing and the mask and the cleaning. And I think that's going to allow us to get back to a, a new normal. And one thing we learned from last year, which I'm really happy about, is we opened the fishing season a, a month early last year just to give people an outdoor outlet that was safe. And um, the fishing season um, uh, would have come to a temporary close. It is open as of today. So um, watch out for the thin ice. But... Um, Enjoy yourself outside. It's the safest place to be. Take care, everybody.